So let me first give you uh, an overview of the, of the of my talk. I mean the the main idea, the main motivation is really that's uh, from a neuroscience point of view, uh, from a bi basic and clinical neuroscience point of view, is that we are interested in the hierarchical organization of the cortex. In other words, I mean, we believe that we can get some information by observing the spatial temporal dynamics at the whole brain level. But we try to go now a step forward, and uh, it's not only enough to, to get some features describing that uh, spatial temporal dynamics, but we try to also to understand in which way this spatial temporal global dynamics is organized. And this is what we call the functional hierarchical organization of brain dynamics. And of course, the key idea is to try to analyze this in different species, in different animals, also in humans. Uh, in healthy conditions, uh, in disease conditions, in very trivial conditions like resting state, but also uh, other type of brain states like uh, sleep, anesthesia, psychedelics, or even during the execution of cognitive tasks. This is the, the big question and the big motivation. And in principle, there are two ways of, uh, or the, there are at least two ways. Uh, Sure, much more ways of trying to, to get some information about the functional hierarchical organization of the brain. One is a pretty direct, and it's what people were applying during the last years, including also ourselves, and it's really just to measure explicitly the causal interactions between the different brain regions, and then try to uh, do a hierarchical analysis of those causal interactions. This is what we call uh, the, the balance of the interaction or, or the breaking of the balance of the interaction. And I will show you, you more explicitly in some of the slides at the beginning. But basically the framework that I am trying to, to explain to you today very briefly is an alternative to this direct option. So uh, in principle, we try to infer uh, this, uh, this hierarchical order in orchestration of the different chains of causal interactions without measuring that. We measure that indirectly by using a very simple trick coming from the second law of thermodynamics, which is we observe the arrow of time in the time signals, and we indirectly infer the underlying causal interactions uh, and, and even the, the hierarchical structure of this uh, causal interaction. And this is one of the main ideas that we try to transmit today. So how to use the arrow of time uh, and this is related with this concept of uh, non civility and equilibrium and hierarchy. And from there, I mean, we will go to the next level. Uh, and it's implicit that uh, given that we, we have an arrow of time and this implies non equilibrium, uh, in non equilibrium system, uh, most of the time you have a very particular type of dynamics, which is a turbulent dynamic that will explain uh, with very simple words what that means. And we will see that that is the case of the brain. And that gives us also extra information about the, the description of this uh, spatial temporal orchestration of spatial temporal dynamics. So, in this first slide, I try to give you uh, or to remember you very briefly what we mean with uh, hierarchical organization of the brain at the functional level. There are many theories, starting by Barthes, uh, Mesulan, and Tichalis. Uh, uh, Joaquin Fuster, a Catalan, <laughs> uh, coming from here, that they, they, they try to really to make sense at the functional level how the different brain areas are organized. Perhaps the most prominent or uh, the most popular uh, theory is the theory of the global workspace that you know very well. And the idea is that we have different brain areas, and but the, 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 the hierarchical level of those brain areas is very different. So there are some and sensorial areas, which are really processing some type of information, sensor motor information, but some key type of functional hubs, which are not necessarily the structural hubs, the anatomical hubs that people were analyzing a lot in the last years, but some functional hubs, which are somehow really orchestrating and organizing the spatial temporal dynamics performing the different type of computation. And this is basically the version proposed by Stan de Hen, 
and change your life. Um, um, and of course, they analyze that uh, not only at the theoretical level, but also at the empirical level. Nevertheless, it's pretty difficult really to quantify that and really and to, to, to really uh, transform this uh, very elegant and very appealing uh, theoretical concept. Uh, how, how to, to mix that with really with the dynamic that we measure at the level of the brain. Nevertheless, we tried uh, recently, uh, actually during the pandemic, uh, and we published as a major human behavior, a way uh, that is related with this first alternative that I mentioned at the very beginning. Okay, let's try to measure explicitly, directly the causal interaction. So we took the HCP data set, as you know, it's a large data set with uh, over a thousand people with the uh, resting state uh, measurements, uh, fMRI, and, and many different cognitive tasks, in fact, uh, seven different cognitive tasks covering many domains of cognitions. And we analyzed that explicitly by using a kind of information-based uh, Granger causality. A bit, uh, particular was a normalized uh, transfer entropy. Uh, and by analyzing this, uh, this Granger causality, this difference uh, 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 chains of causal interactions uh, under the different conditions and performing a kind of intersection, that we were able to quantify and to identify uh, basically who are the key areas orchestrating the rest of the dynamics. Uh, what we are trying to do today is an alternative to that. And actually, that is uh, also a consequence of the pandemic. I actually have done my first PhD in quantum mechanics, so I was in love with Schrodinger and all those guys. And, uh, and I read a lot, but I didn't read uh, this, this particular book, which I strongly recommend, What is Life? I, mean, I, I took the pandemic as a good excuse to read that. <laughs> uh, and it's fantastic. And, and, and actually was really very inspiring. And uh, he was basically claiming that uh, it's very important in the biological context. And, and in fact, he opened the whole field of using non-equilibrium concepts so the modinamical concepts for analyzing the complexity of a uh, of biological system. And basically motivated by that, I mean, this is exactly what, uh, what we do. The key idea is cartoonized here. It's coming from a paper from uh, Danny Bassett, a group uh, from Dean et al, presently published in PNAS. Uh, and just, just look at this cartoon, I mean. It's a very simple system. Actually, it's, it's not the brain. I mean, it's, it's an icing system, to be honest with you. <laughs> but I imagine that it's the brain. Uh, uh, and you have here a condition where you don't have a hierarchical structure because basically all the causal interaction are bilateral, are symmetric. And this is what we call technically detail balance. It's a horrible word. I will call it really the flat hierarchical organization. But OK, in physics, we decided to call that detail balance, and we call detail balance. When you break the detail balance, so when you start to really uh, uh, to implement some hierarchical interaction, uh, causal interaction, then you break the symmetry. And what happens is that uh, basically by doing this, the, the flow of information is not reversible anymore. So if you look that forward in time, uh, or you look that backward in time, uh, you can uh, you can distinguish <laughs> what is forward and what is backward. And this is what we call the arrow of time. It's a very simple idea. So that if we measure the arrow of time, then we can infer how hierarchical organize it at the underlying system. This is this is the whole thing. I stop it. I don't <laughs> question. <laughs> Uh, so let's be more specific. Uh, actually, this is a movie from Christopher Lord, uh, Nola called Tenet, the worst movie of Christopher Nolan. And, <laughs> and I am a fan of Christopher Nolan. But anyway, uh, it's, uh, it's a very good example of the idea that I'm trying to, to explain here. Because in the movie, there are people uh, traveling forwards in time and traveling back in time. So developing entropy or, or, or inverting uh, the, the, the arrow of time of the entropy. And it's very clear here, you see, eh? it's just an ascent. You don't know the movie, hopefully. <laughs> and uh, and uh, you don't need to see them. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and you see that uh, people really traveling normally in time and, and some strange people would go backward in time. So it's very easy to detect here that's a non-equilibrium system with 
breaking the tail balance, so with a very, uh, very hierarchical organization of the underlying causal interactions. And macroscopically, it's absolutely trivial to detect the arrow of time. What you see nearby is a system, which is also an icing spin system. Uh, it's a microscopic system where we, uh, the, the, well, we uh, actually the group of Chasinski broke the balance, pushing the system out of the equilibrium. And what you see here is some observable of that system. It's not important not to know uh, which observable is. It's something that's kind of the dynamics and it's the evolving in time. And one is the forward version and the other is the backward version. To be honest with you, I generated that and I don't know which one is which because I forgot the colors. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but, uh, but the, what that means is that we cannot distinguish that. It's not trivial to distinguish, but the, but the information is there because we know that there is no equilibrium. And this is basically, well, this is uh, the, Okay. There, there are all these movies uh, just uh, as a contrast. I mean, there are really, as I say, clear cases where we have an arrow of time. For example, this uh, glass of wine shattered by a ballet, a scandal per se. But, uh, uh, and then when you have the movie forward or the movie backward, you can distinguish what is what. Here you have a perfect res a reversible system. It's a perfect elastic. Uh, colliding system, like a BDR. And then if you have uh, the two movies, actually it's not working uh, now. One is the forward version and the other is the backward version, but you cannot distinguish that. So here there is a clear arrow of time, here there is a no clear of time. So, and, and this is what we are trying to do uh, now in the context of uh, prime sequence. Namely, uh, we know that when we have this type of organization that could be easy, detectable, the arrow of time, or very, very difficult, as, as in the microscopic case that we have shown at the very beginning. But we know that when we are breaking the detailed balance and when we are pushing the system out of the equilibrium, so the detection of the arrow of time is very well determined. So meaning the forward version or the backward version, they are, we can distinguish that. And even more, we know that there is a very particular entropy, which is called the production entropy, which is increasing. And this is actually the second law of the thermodynamics. This is uh, just telling us that there are some cases, this is like the movie of Tenet, if you want, or like the movie of the glass of wine, it's very uh, easy to distinguish really what is forward and backward. And there are cases where we have a clear, really non-equilibrium and a clear distinction between forward and backward, but it's very difficult to distinguish them. But this information can be extracted, of course. And, and, and this is the key slide uh, of the first part of the talk. What we do is we take the brain, we observe the brain signals, your favorite brain signal. I am doing here with Paul, we have done with ECO, we can, you can do with whatever signals, in whatever space, you can do in sensor space, you can do in source space, in the parcellation that you want and so on. And even at the scale that you want, uh, you will be good. Uh, and then you, you observe the, the forward moving and you observe the reverse and moving. So let's see that we observe just one signal, just to be, uh, to cartoonize that, I mean, so we have this signal in the forward version, and then we flip that, and we have just the reverse version. And the question is, can we distinguish? Can we know? Oh, yeah, this signal is uh, is real. It's the forward one, and that's the backward version. In general, we don't know that, and it's very difficult to detect that. But we know the truth because we generated this by hand. We know that these were the original signal because I measured that, and these are the signals that I flip it. So then I go to a class, uh, to a, a deep uh, uh, learning classifier that and in a supervised way, I try to classify that because I know the answer. And then when I check how good the classifier is, so the performance on a, on a validation set, this number, and now it's a, it's a single number, is telling me the degree of irreversibility. So in other terms, the degree of how much the detail balance was broken, or in other words, how much hierarchical organization underlies the system. This is the whole idea. Uh, and, 
we we are doing this uh, of course we can do this in the whole window we can do this in a sliding window we can do this at the global level at the network level at the local level i will show only result of the global level just as a question of time and the classifier is uh, we call tenet <laughs> just uh, as a joke i mean uh, that means temporal evolution deep learning network <laughs> uh, and it's really the network doing doing the job this is uh, just one of the results not to jump to the second subject turbulence and it's uh, showing really this number so the level of performance of the tenet uh, analyzing the HCP data set, as I said, it's uh, fMRI under resting condition of uh, for thousand subjects. There are two sessions even for resting state, 22 minutes each one, and there are many cognitive tasks. And it's very, the, 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 this is the, this number, this is the level of non stationarity so forget that it's not important now. Uh, but this number is important. What you see is that uh, the, the higher is the number, the, the, the larger is the non reversibility. So the, the most important is the hour of time. So the more hierarchical is the system. And, and, and this is expected, but it's very nice to see that uh, resting compared to all the other uh, cognitive tasks has less reversibility. So it's more flatter. Of course, it's not zero. I mean, there is a lot of organization. We know it's not astonishing. We know that there are networks, right, and networks, and so on, and they have built up because of the hierarchical structure underlying the system. But of course, then when you start to use the system in a very particular way, you are obliged to increase really, or to break even more the detail balance because you need to compute something in particular. Well, we have done this under all different possibilities, network labor, as I say, this is global labor, but uh, network labor, local labor, uh, under different brain state situations. So for example, the level of reversibility is very significantly different uh, in, in persons with anesthesia or with sleep or with coma or with psychedelics and so on, and uh, also in disease cases, it's in, in many cases, not in all, but in many cases, very different. For example, just comparing resting state of healthy people and resting state of schizophrenia or autism or bipolar disorder, then you see a significant difference. I don't have the time to show you that. I have everything in my laptop and you can ask me if you want. Okay, that's bring me to the second point. So if I know that's because I wanted to discover this hierarchical organization of the underlying causality. We were able to discover this indirectly. Uh, and that brought me to the idea of, oh, there is a, an arrow turn and the, and the system is non, non equilibrium. We are always assuming, at this, we, I mean the theoretician, that the system is in equilibrium. Why? Because we understand only equilibrium. <laughs> and we try to do what we understand. But now we see the system is a non equilibrium. And there is a, a very good and interesting feature of many non equilibrium systems, and that they could have a tendency to show really very interesting dynamical behavior. One which is extremely interesting is turbulence. Turbulence, as you know, was introduced by Leonardo da Vinci, uh, introduced as an Italian, turbulenza coming from. Uh, from the Latin turba, crowd, because he was astonishing the, the beauty uh, of, of the turbulent flows in different conditions. But he immediately discovered this is not only crowding movement. So in, 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 in modern language, we'll say it's just randomness, just stochasticity. No, there is a lot of order. I mean, and he tried to capture this order. Even he discovered some of the first law of of turbulence, which are that the size of the of these wheels of these vortices, uh, they, they they follow a, a certain law. Of course, uh, that motivated people in physics, and you now this is a typical cartoon uh, turbulence showing that effect that was discovered by by Leonardo, and that was studied systematically and seriously in the context of physics. And in fact, I mean, uh, people discovered that this, uh, the size of those vortices, they were organized because of the non equilibrium in such way. In fact, this person, uh, Louis Richardson, they are organized in a hierarchical way, different type of hierarchy as we were mentioning before. Uh, and that's uh, where well, he expresses it in a 
beautiful way. I think you can paraphrase it, a poem of Jonathan Swift, and basically try to express in a nice way that this, this hierarchical organization of the different vortices across the space. And Kolmogorov took that, he was a very clever person, as you know, uh, immediately and say, oh, this is related with a very efficient transmission of energy, of course. I mean, if the, in the context of turbulence, just in the fluid dynamics, will not be our context, but just to give you a flavor. This, is, uh, this will contain kinetic energy, so velocity. And of course, if you transmit the velocity from the, from the large uh, wheels to the intermediate wheel to the other wheels and so on, so you have the feeling that, oh, perhaps this transmission is really very clever and very efficient. Well, Kolmogorov demonstrated, and he used it, uh, a function, which funny enough is called a structure function, it has nothing to do with what we call a structure or function in the context of neuroscience. Yeah? It's really a nice casualty. But you will see that this function is something that we are uh, analyzing all the time. It's the shift, I mean, let's say this is the observable that they use, use a velocity in our case would be ball signal or EG, whatever. It's a signal that you want to analyze and it's just the, the quadratic displacement. But if you, if you do a little bit of math, really very elemental, I mean, this is a cousin of this. And this is just the functional connectivity between two regions, the given region, uh, with the distance, Euclidean distance of R. Note that this R has no vector. So meaning that, and, the, and, and that is a typical in turbulence, there is isotropy and uh, homogeneity. But this is basically the functional connectivity only with a little variation that uh, we will take care of how the functional connectivity change or evolve as a function of the distance, nothing else. Uh, he was able to show in the context of fluid dynamics uh, and, and many others, but the main one was for more of his uh, theory of turbulence that, uh, that really there is a very efficient way in the structure function and the energy or in the functional connectivity in a given a spatial region, that you see there is a power law. When you see a power law, it means that there is a very efficient transmission of energy and consequently of information. So, and then we were wondering, given that uh, we were already showing that the brain is in non-equilibrium, uh, and we know that the brain tends to synchronize, this is all oscillation, and we see oscillations everywhere, it was very tempting to think, oh, perhaps there is some very particular type of uh, oscillation, and perhaps the one that are called uh, turbulence. This is the key idea how to analyze turbulence in a non-fluid context, because we don't have water, we don't have wine uh, in the, well, sometimes we have wine, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, usually we have just activity, uh, uh, electrical activity. And, and for that, the key development came from Kuramoto. Uh, Kuramoto analyzes a system of couple oscillators. It's very, very tempting because, as you know, uh, many groups, including my own group, we were really uh, using oscillators, couple oscillators for expressing neural dynamics. And I think we were pretty successful. I mean, that we can uh, uh, explain really many dynamical aspects of the, of the brain. So that, uh, that was a good excuse to see, okay, let's see how Kuramoto analyzed turbulence in a, in a non-fluid system, and in particular in a system which is just capital oscillators. What you see here is, is a capital oscillator. So in fact, I mean, it's a Hopf oscillator, it's a Stuart Landau uh, oscillator. So these are the, the single oscillators, and what you see here is just the capital. And the coupling is like all the coupling, but in particular, he introduced a very special coupling that he called non-local coupling, but it's nothing else as a local coupling defined by an exponential decay rule. Uh, and that is also very good because we know uh, from Henry Kennedy and many others that the brain, at least the underlying anatomical structure, show an exponential decay. Uh, so, uh, but okay, forget uh, Henry Kennedy for the moment. I mean, then uh, he defined the way of, uh, of measuring the synchronization. This is the so-called, usually the global Kuramoto parameter, which is just the sum, I mean, it's integral because he 
has a here many, many oscillators, is the sum usually of the exponential of the imaginary part of the phase. And you know that the module of that uh, is uh, when it's one, you have full synchronization. When it's zero, you have no synchronization. This is a distortion of that because you introduce this locality, this exponential decay, and therefore we call this the local Kuramoto order parameter. The interpretation is exactly the same, but now it's local. So for a given region in the space and for a given uh, time point, the, the absolute value of this or the module of this is also between zero and one, and it's giving you the same interpretation, but now it's local. And that is great because that means that we can measure with these uh, vortices, the wheels that we were seeing in turbulence. In fact, this is a simulation from the paper of Kuramoto, where you see four different uh, oscillators at different space position and at different time position. What you see is the evolution of this Kuramoto, local Kuramoto order parameter. So the color is really the wheels, the different level of local synchronization. And when you have really here, the things like that, that you have high variability uh, of this uh, local Kuramoto order parameter across space and across time, so high variability in both directions, then you have a turbulent system, even if it's not the fluid. And it's turned out, and I have to accelerate that analyzing this in the HCP again, just look at this, at this uh, plot. This is really the variability of the local Kuramoto order parameter in those thousand uh, subjects and the resting state condition. And what you see very clearly, and then you can use surrogates in order to control that and do all the, the statistical paraphernalia. I mean, and, and, uh, and, I mean, and we see that it's really that's true. And just to save a little bit of time, this is the Hollywood version of the <laughs> turbulence. I mean, what you see here is a particular subject, the 3D rendering or flat rendering. And basically, uh, in a particular resting state session, and what you see is the evolution in time of the local Kuramoto parameter. So you see the wheels, and you see really this high variability across space and the highest variability across time. Uh, if you forget turbulence and semant uh, the semantic of turbulence and uh, Leonardo, non equilibrium, uh, all my effort <laughs> during this talk, I mean, this is nothing else as just another way, a, a more, more, more detailed way of looking at the level of synchronization. In neuroscience, we are always contaminated and use it to look at the global level of synchronization. And therefore, we are in love with the global Kuramoto parameter. Well, this is an extension to see more information, perhaps at the local level of uh, synchronization, there is more information. And we know because at the global level of synchronization, there's a lot of information. This is what we call metastability and was used as a biomarker for many different things. This is even more powerful. And just to finish, because if not, this now will kill me. Uh, 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 well, this measure turbulence and measure that we can associate and can uh, be derived from turbulence and more related really for, with information capability, information transmission across the space time. We see that under different uh, conditions like coma, sleep, uh, meditation, and so on, they are significantly different. And even more, if you analyze the turbulence at the network level, then you have a really very different patterns. Uh, for example, I mean, coma is very different from sleep. I mean, both are unconscious, uh, and both uh, has a low turbulence. Uh, but uh, but the structure of uh, why would you have a low turbulence is totally different. So you have a, a fingerprint, a signature at the network level of the local level of metastability that you can analyze. So conclusion. I, I hope that this is useful. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, of course, uh, I, 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 I was not pretending to talk about modeling. We, you know, I mean, we are coming from modeling. So the, the beauty is that we are using all these new observables, not only for characterizing in a much more individualized and specific way different situations, for example, Alzheimer's disease at the individual level, but also to adjust in a much more constrained way a model, and we were, of course, showing that that can be done, but just to leave it. So this is pre-pandemic time, I mean, <laughs> and it's not wine, it's coffee. <laughs> <laughs>